Chad, this is a question that we get from a ton of people uh, in one form or another. So basically a big question that people have is it all revolves around aerobic metabolism. Some people call that's a portion of the Krebs cycle. It's basically no Krebs well, cycle is a portion, a portion of, of aerobic, aerobic metabolism, metabolism. Forgive yeah. me. But it's basically, if we're really talking about this, it's how our body takes food, makes it energy, so <clears> then we can press some pedals, yep. right? So we're going to dive. Um, so this is going to be a deep dive, and basically we're going to get into this and hopefully give you some actionable takeaways so then you can understand how it happens, because I do feel like it really does help once you get an understanding of Absolutely, it. and I'll explain afterwards why this information is particularly important. Oh, and one thing I should say, we're too. We're going to do this a little differently today, too. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, before we jump in, uh, if you're watching live, you can actually see a diagram. So Chad has drawn a diagram to help walk him through this and also to help give you a, a, a walk through an understanding of it. If you're watching live, uh, producer Tucker will be switching back and forth over to this slide in between Chad and this. So then you can see it and you can also go to forum.trainerroad.com and you can check out this diagram and pair it with what you're hearing. And it's like a perfect understanding experience. Uh, Producer Tucker was so pumped. He just did a air fist pump he did. <laughs> about the diagram. He's excited. Good energy, Tucker. Um, cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so let's dive in. I guess, where do you want to start, Chad? Okay. So if you have the diagram, you can, you can take a peek at it. If you don't, I'm going to try really hard to assume that everybody is only listening. If you have the diagram, it's just icing on the cake. Rather this, this, or, uh, this needs to be explained in words and words alone. Alone. Um, so <clears throat> originally this was going to be a discussion on the Krebs cycle, but you can't explain the Krebs cycle without explaining what comes before it and what comes after it, because it's only one component of aerobic metabolism and it's only one smaller component of cellular respiration, which is what we're going to talk about. Right. So cellular respiration, as Nate put it, is basically, or perhaps you put it, mm -hmm. taking nutrients and making energy in, mm -hmm. in particular ATP. And we're going to start, we're going to jump a little bit into the, the inner workings of it all and start with glucose in the muscle cell. So how it got cool. there is irrelevant. Right, right now, yeah. the, the, the glucose is in the cell, whether it got there through the bloodstream, whether it was already in the cell in the form of glycogen, doesn't matter. Cool. We're starting with glucose and we're only talking about glucose. So fat and protein, I'm going to touch on only very briefly a little later on. It will make sense at the, at the time, but this is taking glucose, going all the way through cellular respiration, which from this point forward, I'm going to call cell respiration because cellular is a hard word for me. <laughs> it is a hard word. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> starting with glucose and finishing with 38 ATP. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's, not, that's not a hard number. I'll explain that a little later too. Mm -hmm. So cell respiration takes place in four stages. Mm -hmm. um, the first stage is anaerobic glycolysis. So, so there's only of the, of the four stages, only the first one is anaerobic. And this, this is quite simply where the glucose is broken down into a couple pyruvates. And I'm going to use terms that you don't need to know what they are. And I'm going to use some acronyms. You don't even need to know, know what they are, but they come into play later. So I'm going to, I'm going to announce their arrival. Cool. So in anaerobic glycolysis, this anaerobic portion of cell respiration, the glucose is split into pyruvate. You get a couple ATP out of it net because it takes a couple to make them. It actually makes four, but you only get two out of it mm -hmm. and a couple NADH. Okay. This takes place within the cytosol of the cell. So within all the goo that's supporting all the organelles and the mitochondria in particular, mm -hmm. that's, that's just floating around. Uh, that, that's where it's happening in, the, in that goo. Cool. Um, so basically this first stage is all about taking glucose, converting it to pyruvate. Makes then sense. that pyruvate is then oxidized through a process called pyruvate oxidation. This <laughs> is where the aerobic respiration portion of this process, this cell respiration four stage process takes place and everything from this point forward, stages two, three, and four, are all aerobic. Got it. So here the pyruvate is broken down or it's metabolized. It goes through a number of reactions. It gives off a bit of CO2, a couple more of those NADH, which are going to come into play later, and something called acetyl coenzyme A. So we're just going to call it ACOA or acetyl CoA. Um, and this is basically the fuel for the Krebs cycle. And this is why we couldn't jump straight to the Krebs cycle. We have to know where does this come from? It actually comes from anaerobic metabolism and the first stage of aerobic metabolism. Hmm. All this takes place within the mitochondria itself, in particular, the matrix of the mitochondria. So yep. the, the deep inner workings of the mito. So the second stage is just about taking that pyruvate, turning it into acetyl coenzyme A. Mm -hmm. That is then oxidized via the citric acid cycle, or as it's otherwise known, the Krebs cycle, or as it's otherwise known, the tricarboxylic acid cycle or TCA cycle. Whatever you want to call it. Exactly. It's all the same thing. <laughs> Let's just call it the Krebs cycle. Um, but the Krebs cycle and why it's called the citric acid cycle is it takes that, that vitamin C and, and it, it goes through a two times cycle. And in that cycle, it kicks off certain things. CO2 being one of them, more of that NADH that I'm going to talk about, a single ATP, something called FADH 
goes back through it again, kicks off another ATP, some more NADH. And what we get, what the outcome of this is, is 10 of those NADH. And I'll explain their importance in just a second. A couple of the FADH. And then in total, up to this point, we've got four ATP. Mm -hmm. So this entire process only yielded four ATP. Wow. And this all took place in the matrix as well. So this phase, the, the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle is about taking that acetylcholine A and turning it into NADH. Got it. This for what it's, what it's also important to recognize, this is about where fat and protein come into play. So if we metabolize fat through beta oxidation or protein through a similar process, it comes in as, and this is a vast simplification, as acetylcholine A. So it enters the process right here. Got comes it. right into the Krebs cycle. Okay, so then the NADH is then oxidated or oxidized via a process called oxidative phosphorylation. Uh -huh. This is, we've, you've probably heard this term. You had to have heard this term over the course of your training as an endurance athlete. Uh -huh. um, for simplicity, I'll just call it oxfos. Oxfos consists of two things, the electron transport chain, probably a term you've heard also, yes. and chemiosmosis. Now the electron transport chain Cre creates a, basically a chemical gradient, so a chemical slope, so, so to speak. Uh -huh. And then the chemiosmosis takes that energy from that gradient and uses it to create ATP. Uh -huh. And this is where we see the huge bang for the buck. And, and it's also interesting to note that this is where oxygen enters the picture. So aerobic metabolism at the very end stage here is when the oxygen actually kicks in to, to pick up some of the some of the electrons, some of the hydrogens and make water as one of the couple of byproducts that comes off of aerobic metabolism. Huh, cool. So it's not until then that we really need oxygen. Other phases are dependent on the oxygen, but this is the only phase that actually directly uses it. Huh. Okay, so now those 10 ADH, why are they so important? Because each one of those creates three ATP. So this is a net output of 30 ATP. So that's where you get the most ATP. Yeah, so up until this point, we've only garnered four ATP. Uh -huh. Now we get 30 from the NADH and we get another four from the FADH. Okay. So this is the most important in terms of aerobic capabilities process in the entire cell respiration process. But it's interesting to note that it started with anaerobic metabolism. We're metabolizing glucose here. We first used anaerobic metabolism. So all these people who are worried about creating or building a big anaerobic work capacity, the anaerobic work capacity still funnels into your aerobic work capacity, which is why it's so important to have an aerobic capacity if you want to repeat anaerobic they, efforts. They never really operate in isolation like we like to Ever. think. No. And, always... and, and what feeds the aerobic system? When, and when it comes to glucose, what feeds it but anaerobic, the anaerobic process? Right. Fat and protein, that, that's a different case. They're, they're entirely aerobic. But anaerobic takes place, or glucose metabolism starts anaerobically. And glucose is used very aerobically and it yields a heck of a lot of energy once it makes it through this entire process. <laughs> Inherently tied. So that last process, that stage four, the oxidative phosphorylation, is just about taking that NADH, turning it into ATP. This happens on the membranes or between the membranes. So it's a very Got specific it. portion of the mitochondria. But what this shines a light on is how important the mitochondria are to aerobic performance. This is why we're always talking about different pathways that, that create or lead to the, the turning on of PGC up or whatever, the, the master mm -hmm. switch for oxidative, or uh, sorry, mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh -huh. This is why we're so concerned with growing our mitochondria. This is why we do aerobic work, whether it's long, slow work or high intensity work, all we want is more mitochondria. And there are other things that go along with it, lockstep, but more mitochondria, more aerobic work capacity, more energy coming out of a very small amount of input energy. So. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, they are another line from biology class, ATP is the currency of the cell, right? That's, that's, the, that's the other term. It's <laughs> like the other one that, yep. that we heard all the time. So with ATP coming in and obviously so much of it coming from, from that process. That final process. It, yeah, it, once again, it makes sense why when we're talking about increasing your density of mitochondria and the efficiency yeah. of the whole process. But, but too often huge. people see glucose and they think, oh, that's metabolized anaerobically. So if I want to work, do a whole bunch of anaerobic work, I really need to build my anaerobic engine so that I can process a lot of sugar. But that sugar is the most of the energy, most of the ATP coming from that sugar is done aerobically. We need to have a strong aerobic system if we're going to be a good aerobic athlete. That's a key point right there. That's like a big misunderstanding that I think a lot of people might have. That's yeah. a head slapper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to have a good aerobic system to be a good aerobic athlete. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Anaerobic, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. That, that. But, but back to the anaerobic side of things, if you want to be able to repeat, and I said this earlier, mm -hmm. anaerobic efforts again and again and again, you need to offload that pyruvate that builds up and you do that aerobically. If it doesn't get offloaded, what happens? It ferments, it becomes lac lactic acid. Mm -hmm. And then, then we have to deal with, with all the complications that come with that. Mm -hmm. But the bigger aerobic system you have, the, the longer it takes for that pyruvate to well up to a point where it's converted to lactate, mm. the more of the pyruvate that's going to the mitochondria and producing aerobic energy. 
the more work we can do aerobically. Huh. It's, so I guess I'm going to take a couple steps back and ask for like the, the, the simple, clear explanations on a couple things on this. Sure. So <clears throat> basically when we take in food and we're talking about, and you talked about protein and fat slightly, but mm -hmm. when we talk about utilizing glycogen, this whole process or glucose or really. glucose, yeah. yeah, forgive me. When we talk about utilizing glucose, this whole process lays out the fact that utilizing glucose isn't necessarily bad, right? It's no. all necessary. It's all part of it. No, it's yeah, it's, it's highly productive. And, right. and, and honestly, and some research has surfaced, which we'll get into later, but if you want to be on a fat adapted diet, it's going to limit your work capacity. Yep. That's what we know as of right now. Yeah. Like I said, there is some information that's kind of messing with that a little bit. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like, once again, when a lot of people are like, for example, if you go and get depending on the person probably doing the test. But when you go and get a, um, like, like the, a, a, a gas exchange test, right. Where mm -hmm. they're basically testing where you start to burn more fat, where you start to burn more, more glucose, yeah. right. Work intensity goes up. <laughs> you're going to start to burn more, more and more and more glucose. Yep. And a lot of the time it's seen as like, and I and understand why, but a lot of the time it's seen really bad. If you don't, if you burn glucose too often, too early, that sort of a thing. And a lot of the time that's because it's tied into like certain performance markers or certain adaptations that you may or may not have. Mm -hmm. But this just shows, I think, uh, uh, that glucose isn't the evil thing or utilization of it isn't the Never. evil thing. For an, from an endurance athlete's perspective, <clears throat> glucose, carbohydrate, glycogen, hugely important. Yep. If you want to go fast, you got to have sugar on board. Yep. Yeah, absolutely key. And I guess that that, like, how do you increase the mitochondrial density? Like we're talking about yeah. here, because obviously this is the process where it breaks food down into energy. So how do you increase that? Cause that's the end goal, right? To get faster through training. I mean, that's basically what we do when we elevate FTP, <clears throat> there is a glycolytic component to that. There is a carb burning component to that. But as you've just seen, even that is hugely aerobic. Mm -hmm. So, so basically everything we do is with the interest of increasing our aerobic capacity. Mm -hmm. So maybe we do it with long, slow work that taxes the muscles and uses different pathways to turn on that mitochondrial biogenesis. Maybe we do it with high intensity work. Maybe we do it with sprint training. There's so many different ways, but the, the end goal is, is the same across the board, more mm -hmm. aerobic work capacity. Yeah. And does this also tie in, I guess, like, uh, I guess talking about increasing mitochondrial density and everything else like that, you can go back, geez, maybe four episodes when we talked about that really cool study that came out that was basically proving the fact that if you were really, you did a lot of training early mm -hmm. on in your life, oh, especially, yeah. and you kind of, uh, you can almost bank the nuclei of these, yeah, of or these the, cells. The, yeah, the nuclei of the mitochondrial cells. Yep. And yeah. then it's, it's a, it's a theory. It's a going theory. Yeah. And then that you can basically get those back quicker later on, right? Yeah. The, the, the nucleus, the nuclei are still there. So the, the reformation of the mitochondrial cells or mitochondrial mm -hmm. bodies takes place a little more quickly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But Which, again, it, really anything that nets us more mitochondria are going to net us, assuming that they're healthy mitochondria are going to net us greater aerobic performance. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Coggin has a really great chart on this and Tucker, can you Google this right now? Put it in the form. If you Google Coggin power zones, chart benefits, mm. um, there's yeah. one where it shows the different zones and then what benefit you get from each one. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool. Cause there is this sliding scale of like what, um, physiological changes you get. And for my mitochondrial enzymes increase and the enzymes too. Yep. Yeah. It's but like uh, I said, there's a lot of things that go with it. You can't just yeah, have more sure. mitochondria, but it's a sweet spot and a uh, threshold are yeah. like, that's the, that's what you want and yeah. for stuff like, uh, increased VO two max and uh, higher stroke volume or maximum cardiac output. That's VO two max yeah, where yeah. you get some from sweet spot and threshold, but not as much for VO two max. But in terms of which just makes, raw aerobic benefit, it goes, it runs the spectrum. Yep. yep. Except and for maybe neuromuscular. And it makes sense. You're like, you look at this chart and you're like, oh yeah, I breathe really hard there. And that's where my legs burn. Yep. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's just, it's very, it's a very interesting chart to look at. And, and what happens when we increase FTP, but we're just increasing our aerobic work capacity, really. We're, we're, we're capable of metabolizing more sugar so mm -hmm. that, that aerobic, that pyruvate doesn't well up, doesn't turn to lactate. And if it does turn to lactate, we can still utilize it because we have a ton of, yeah, a ton yeah. That's a great way to summarize it right yeah, there. Except yeah. for the last little stutter. That, um, <clears throat> I, th I think it was great, Chad. Um, but that, that chart, when we have it up there, that's also, we talk about this all the time that, you know, this is specific goals of training is we're trying to stress energy systems in a particular way and specific energy systems, you Sending know, and, signals to our body and do it strategically. And, and that's why. So, and really all about this. So when you are getting faster, you are able to produce more work. 
uh, it's because you either have more mitochondria, they're becoming more efficient. The whole process is better in one degree. Or yeah. Another. If I can touch on that real fast too, I said the, the, the optimal outcome is that we get 38 ATP for every uh, molecule of glucose that mm -hmm. comes into the system. It's not how it works. I mean, it typically is more around 30, 32, and that declines over mm -hmm. the course of an interval. It can decline over the course of a long workout. It can decline over the course of a race. It can decline. So your aerobic efficiency basically tanks mm -hmm. the healthier your mitochondria are. There are a lot of factors that will influence that, but I don't know that we ever see a full 38 ATP. If we do it, so it's not, it's not common. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. If you like that video, you should subscribe to our channel. There's more where that came from and even like the video down below with a thumbs up or leave us a comment. If you want to see race analysis videos, click right over here. And if you want to get your coaching questions answered, click over here. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, head over to trainerroad.com. It works. Trust us. Just trust us. <laughs> we guarantee it. Oh yeah. Or your money back. It's true. Take us up on it.